information uh, gathering uh, process. Then, then there's this third case, which I, I'm somewhat ambivalent about. I, I started thinking about it only recently, and so this probably showed in, in, the, in the chapter. Liquid representation. So liquid representation is this form of representation that uh, uh, I think at, uh, at play in, in so-called models of delegative or liquid democracy. So liquid democracy is a system where people can give their votes to anyone they like, either for a given term or just on certain issues, with the option of recall at any point in time. And uh, you can also retain your right to input throughout. So according to one of its early theoreticians, Brian Ford, delegative democracy, as he prefers to call it, concretely allows anyone who cannot participate directly in a particular vote to delegate their vote to someone they trust to participate and vote on their behalf. And additionally, delegations are transitive, meaning that a delegated vote can be further delegated as desired. And finally, voters can always override their delegate choices in particular meetings if they choose to attend, and voters can revoke or change their delegation at any point in time. So why is that an improvement on electoral democracy? Well, I hope it's clear. It's because anyone can be chosen as a representative. You don't have a slate of pre-selected candidates that end up uh, you know, looking very much the same and, and are, are shaped by certain party you know, uh, dynamics. It could be anyone. It could be your neighbor, it could be uh, your grandfather, it could be your family doctor, it could be anyone you actually trust. So this sounds widely impractical, yet there are already uh, various proofs of concept out there in the real world. For example, the Demoex party in Sweden first used a liquid democracy system between 2002 and 2016. There are also now uh, software platforms that, are, that have been created to facilitate vote delegation, uh, as well as delegation-based online discussion and deliberation uh, as well. So these systems, you may have heard of them, are called liquid feedback and ad hocracy. Uh, for example, the liquid feedback system was used by the German Pirate Party uh, for, the, for the last few years. So I find those you know, uh, attempts to open up electoral representation and, and make it more fluid, more liquid, to make the, the status of democratic representation representative much more uh, accessible, very interesting. My worry, though, is that at the, at, at the heart of this model, you still have a principle of distinction. You still have to stand out in the eyes of someone. So we're not equal in front of this. And besides, for all the optimism and enthusiasm of the you know, theorists and advocates of liquid democracy, there's this risk that is, I think, in, in this star society in which we live, is very prevalent. The, the, star, the, the risk of star, so-called star voting, which is like basically, you know, you would all the votes would be siphoned by people like Kim Kardashian or or or, or a Trump-like figure again, you know, they, they, because they have so much social science, they have access to media, they can they can uh, uh, boost their, their visibility, and, and and this would defeat the purpose really. So argue that given their intrinsic democratic features and some of their extrinsic democratic features, overall there's a um, there should, we probably should have um, a preference for low democratic representatives over self-selected representatives, and in turn uh, um, of self-selected publics over elected bodies, including liquid ones. And I think that um, this conclusion actually is supported by the Greek. Uh, example, the Greek history. So classical Athens moved from the 5th to the 4th century to a much more um, lotocratic form of proto-representation. So, you know, historian, historians are uncomfortable with using the term representative democracy to speak about ancient Athens, because ancient Athens is supposed to be the archetype of direct democracy. But my own reading, and I, and I defend that in, a, in, in an earlier chapter, is that this is just not true. Um, even Athens, even classical ha Athens had representative schemes. They couldn't have you know, functioned otherwise. Um, even, I mean, so, so to me it's very clear in the organization of, of a body like the Boulet, the, the Council of 500, they were randomly selected to set the agenda for the assembly. Obviously, they were making that agenda setting, they were doing this agenda setting on behalf of the rest of the citizenry. 
and they, they were de facto representatives. Because once you have my minimalistic, uh, my minimalist definition of representation, it's much, much easier to use the term to characterize something like the boulet. Similarly, uh, the nomo the tetai in the 5th century, in the 4th century, which were uh, bodies of judges selected at random between 200 and 1,000, I think. Uh, they, they were supposed to review laws, but also generate them. Uh, in the end, we're doing a legislative, uh, we're doing, we're performing a legislative function on behalf of the rest of the citizens. And I would argue, and this is probably more provocative, and you know, I, this is not really the argument I would push the most, but even the, the archetype of the direct um, uh, democracy moment in ancient Athens, the assembly of the people, was not all that dem all that um, direct, because in fact only a fifth of the entire citizenry could gather at any point in time. So up to 8,000 people out of uh, 30,000 citizens or so. So that means that de facto, those people were going to make decisions on behalf of the rest. And to me, again, because I have this minimal definition of representation, that counts as a form of representation. Of self-selected representation, if you will. And okay, why did I mention the Greek experience? Because they started with um, the, the center of, of the popular sovereignty, you might say, was the Greek assembly, where anybody could show up. So it was the spatially open form of um, what I call representation, right? Spatially open, self-selected representation. But it was very vulnerable to uh, uh, orators and uh, oligarchs who managed twice to convince the democracy to self commit suicide, pretty much, to abolish the democracy willingly. So after that bad experience, the Greeks said, okay, this is not working, we need a system that's a bit more immune to the power of deliberators and the infiltrations of the oligarchs. So what they did is transfer the legislative power from the fifth century, uh, from, from the people's assembly to these bodies created in the fourth century, the nomothetai, the, the, the courts who we're in charge of now legislating. Uh, and from our 20th and 21st century perspective, we tend to read this as a demotion of the democracy, as a loss of power for the people, and as a rise of the judges. You know, like, oh, look, even the Greeks moved towards a form of counter majoritarian system, uh, they, they anticipated uh, the Supreme Court. And uh, I think that this is a completely anachronistic reading. I think it's a, a much better reading. Um, and here, I, I, uh, I, I'm in total agreement with my colleague Daniela Kamak at Yale who's made this argument. I think this is, if anything, a reinforcement of the, the power of the demos, just different, differently conceptualized. Conceptualized as, um, uh, you know, represented by those jurors who, may, who are making decisions on behalf of the rest, and, and who are making laws that were less vulnerable to oligarchic takeover. And, I mean, uh, a good, a particularly good argument, I think, for this view is that the, the, the body of uh, 200,000 jurors were m mostly constituted of poor people because the function was paid and the, the selection was by lot. Um, it's, it's, statistically, it was mostly poor people who actually staffed those courts. Not, uh, it, this, has not so this has nothing to do with the Supreme Court, right? Um, okay, so. Uh, so, so, so the point of bringing up Greece was just to say, look, the Greeks empirically came to the same conclusion that we should probably locate the legislative power not so much, definitely not in an elected body, because they knew this was an oligarchic invention, um, but maybe not in a self-selected body, because we, we've got all those problems. So why don't we move into a, um, a randomly selected body? And I think we should today probably do something uh, Similar, and I'm not sure exactly what form it would take. But um, so, if you ask me, what would a, a non-electoral democracy look like? Again, I'm not entirely sure what's feasible, viable in the modern age. But I think it would uh, look a lot more like classical Athens than um, than our current systems, with a central, all-purpose, randomly selected body, regularly reauthorized by referendum, and constantly open to the input of self-selected crowds via online platforms. So it would be a sort of technologically empowered uh, and perhaps conceptually improved version of, of ancient Athens, of classical Athens. And importantly, the last point I, I want to leave you with is that um, 
even if democratic legitimacy, as I suggest in the paper, requires periodically renewed movements of majority and authorization, it is conceivable to envisage the democratic legitimacy of a system in which there exists no stable elected representative assembly whatsoever. This is not to say that even in theory such a, such a system is the most desirable, and certainly a lot more experimentation will need to be conducted at the small scale and in all kinds of contexts to, to ascertain the respective merits of variously uh, open forms of democratic representation. But I think, um, at least conceptually, it's, uh, it's, uh, it makes sense. Thank you very much. That's a terrific talk. Um, provides us lots of things to think about. And now we're going to hear uh, some questions from Aaron Brown, who's a graduate student in political science programming. Thank you, Professor Moore. That was uh, wonderful. Oh, let me make sure. Um, sorry, I just want to make sure I have a time. How much time do we have, to say? Uh, well, of course, I only have a phone. Six an hour. Great. But I, yeah. Okay. Um, thank you again for uh, for sharing that with me with us, and uh, thank you to Professor Wallach for making this possible. Um, I will, uh, and to express my gratitude, I will keep try to keep my comments mercifully concise um, mm -hmm. and grounded in the text itself, as opposed to whatever I'm bringing to it. Um, so where to start? Um, and so I'm thinking I will kind of throw what I have out there and then, well, I guess I should just make a decision whether to uh, then open it up to questions or we'll see how, how you're feeling. Yeah, sure. If you feel like you want to d d respond right away, ad hoc. Um, okay, so um, I wanted to start by throwing out, or just kind of reiterating, in my own words, a few distinctions which I think, uh, which really spoke to me. I, I'm generally, um, I'm, I'm really sympathetic to uh, your, what seems to be your desire to uh, ask us not to take for granted uh, this link between the kind of voluntaristic part of what we think of when we think of democracy or dem democratic legitimacy and the perhaps more, more intrinsically democratic, that is, inclusive uh, part. Um, I, I'm very sympathetic to that. And, and to me, uh, that, uh, that aim uh, is, I think, really well represented by the sense I'm getting of a, of a larger distinction between openness on the one hand and this idea of directness on the other. And part of the reason I, I, I thought about it in that terms is I noticed uh, just uh, in the table of contents uh, that uh, chapter four is a kind of devoted to Rousseau yes. uh, and is titled Rousseau's Mistake uh, and the Myth of Direct Democracy. And my eyes partially just went there because uh, I myself am kind of particularly interested in, in uh, I'm somewhat critical of the way in which theorists of uh, of democracy in the context of, of workplace representation, like mm -hmm. G.D.H. Cole and Carol Pateman have kind of turned to Rousseau, um, and so of course I went there, uh, and, and, and you know, not to please tell me if this is wrong, but I, I, I kind of sense a kind of you know I um, I think that uh, part of what is kind of ingenious but still fundamentally troubling about Rousseau is uh, uh, the way. Uh, that he uh, at least uh, attempts to convince us to exchange directness for openness. And I don't mean it in a kind of like he's secretly a totalitarian sort of way, um, but just in a, in, a, in, a, in a kind of, I think, much more genius way. Um, and so I'm wondering um, if you have any, any thoughts on, on, on that. Um, Sorry, on what? Uh, on, yeah, on, uh, on the role, well, run just the role of Rousseau in, in, your, in your project. Um, and Rousseau's notion of directness, or, or this myth of direct democracy that, that you've referred to, right. and how that relates in contrast to your notion of, of openness. And then another, uh, another distinction which I found uh, really interesting was when it comes to openness, that between temporal openness on the one hand and spatial openness on the other. I believe it, it comes up on, on page 31 in, in particular, um, when you are, are, are kind of contrasting uh, uh, the lot of representation 
uh, with self-selective uh, self representation. Lotocratic being the kind of uh, the more explicitly temporally open model, and uh, uh, the lotocratic model, um, and um, the the kind of you, the way in which you you read that that uh, notion of lotocratic representation into that famous Arist the famous Aristotelian quote yeah. um, uh, kind of really brings up the the contrast between those two things shows what the trade off between those two things might look like that quote you know the uh, democracy being defined defined as ruling and being ruled by others in turn yeah. right and when you sit on those last words in turn, you see what the temporally aspect and what you might be sacrificing, right? The fact that you still have rule, um, um, as opposed to, right, he, he, he gives that as an example and not a kind of more inchoate form of participation. Um, and so that's something I would be just interested in, in hearing more about. Um, your ideas of, I mean, and it, it seems that, that for you, temporal openness is perhaps more important to defining um, um, democracy, I'm going to just trip on that word. <laughs> I completely agree. I don't know what other words. I, I, I kind of I do have a tendency to add nest to things, but I'm not sure if that means you should do it. <laughs> uh, okay, so those are just two things I wanted to bring up, not be uh, not because I had a particularly specific question about them, but just because I personally like to hear you talk more about. Um, and then something more specific, and this relates to, because um, uh, it's something that, that doesn't come up, at least in this chapter, is the role that uh, particularly the lotocratic form of representation might play in, uh, uh, I say, fixing, because I think there's a, a general, but fixing uh, political discourse, or at least making dis political discourse better. I mean, I think that there is a, a kind of general sense, at least currently more than in my short lifetime, that popular, popular sense that discourse is broken in some way. And, and I have to admit that off the bat that I, I'm perhaps maybe I'm kind of a partisan of, of partisanship. Okay. Um, and, uh, and so I'm wondering what your thoughts are about how uh, uh, the lotocratic model which not only provides a kind of protection of political equality as a kind of negative, in the negative, but actually it positively affirms and forces us to confront with the fact that, no, like, I, ha I have no less of a right to be a part of this process as anybody else. And that right is understood in, in a more substantive sense, not, not just of, I have a right to kind of push, you know, have some weight in the process of, of of who makes the decisions, right? And that might be based on character or ideally a platform of some kind. But in any case, it's not just that, but to actually rule. Um, and so I'm wondering uh, your, your thoughts on, on how that might um, affect or perhaps is completely separate from the issue of, of the quality of our discourse, both in terms of... Uh, uh, Sorry, the, what is distinct from the... Oh yes, uh, uh, just the the uh, uh, how how much the form of representation in question, how committed it is to the idea of one person one vote. Though in this case, it's not one person one vote; it's you know one person one rulership or or lottery ticket or whatever you want. want to, um, that uh, uh, how much to, to what extent is the the commitment to that, and that this, the, the kind of zeal with which one institutionally commits to that, what effect do you think that might have on, on uh, political discourse? I mean, I, I think of kind of Tocqueville's kind of, uh, in particular, I was thinking of Tocqueville's observations in Democracy in America about how the democratic citizen is, uh, well, let me phrase it this way, because I, I um, you bring up in your, and this is not so much in your discussion of lotocratic representation, but in self-selective models of representation, you bring up the study from Finland. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'll just quote that here. Uh, one interesting finding in a recent study 
in an experiment in crowdsourced policymaking recently conducted in Finland, uh, is that one possible reason for the passive <coughs> rather than active, and sorry before this you're explaining that, you know, the, that there is a kind of uh, vanguardism or volunteerism that one has to be aware of happening when, when you have these kind of open models. That one explanation for the passivity, the fact that everybody just can stand up and you know do their civic duty, um, if as it's often uh, as it's often described, um, one way to uh, understand that or to, to explain that is that uh, is the feeling that other people have that their concerns were already voiced by others, mm -hmm. that it's already been taken care of. Well, that you know somebody would have taken care of it because what do I have to say? Um, that's at least how I read that. And on one level, when it comes to the model of self-selection, that, that's a boon because it, it suggests that, you know, there's actually a kind of a what you call a kind of attenuated majority represent, you know, uh, uh, authorization going on. That it's not just virtual representation that we're talking about here, that it's, but from the level of being concerned about the, 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 the kind of quality of political discourse, does it bode well, uh, and I'm not suggesting that you, you think one way or the other on this, but does it bode well uh, that we are so willing to presume uh, that, uh, uh, that I don't have anything special, or that, that the individual doesn't have anything special or, or, or important to say, particularly if the whole kind of premise on, on, these, on, on a kind of reforming democracy in this way is to is to to kind of uh, defend the idea of one person, one vote, one person, one voice, one person, one rule. Okay. So that was, I'm going to stop there, because okay, if I keep great, going, I'll just make it more confusing. Can I just ask you to uh, crystallize your, your comment yeah. about partisanship? Yeah. Why? Because that was something that indicated a potential conflict or a yeah. difference between you and Professor Lomonos? I, I, I will. I, I think I, I realize that that would have required kind of going farther than... Okay. And, but but I, I think I can, just very briefly. Okay. That I think that... Um, uh, I think that sometimes uh, the... Right, the the emphasis on this on the democratic inclusivity of this value has... Uh, the effect of suggesting that politics can be dumbed down, so to speak. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that at least one of the arguments for epistocracy, for example, uh, is the idea that politics simply can't be you know, dumbed down in that sense. Um, and uh, uh, partisanship uh, uh, sometimes uh, rises from the view that one person simply cannot understand the issue uh, uh, because the issue is much larger or much, much more complex uh, 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 than others will be, uh, would be willing uh, uh, to admit. I know partisanship can, can kind of come for other reasons. It can also just kind of come from like a deep sense of, well, you're wrong, I'm right. Um, so I guess that's why I brought up partisanship, but perhaps okay. it's besides the point. No, 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 of course, partisanship, that's uh, an objection I get all the time, so I have uh, to So, okay, I'll, I'll take your comments in order, actually, I'm very grateful for them. Uh, so, so, the role of Rousseau, well, I love Rousseau, but I think he, he was wrong on a lot of things. <laughs> and one of the mistakes is to um, reduce sovereignty to this moment of final say. And, and, and a purely kind of like uh, uh, non-deliberately final say at that. So that's what allows him, I think, to, to cultivate this myth of direct democracy. He thinks that we can have this you know, pseudo-constitutional moment where the sovereign wakes up and then says yes or no, and that's what makes a democracy. And in fact, what he does by doing that is legitimize ruled by aristocrats the rest of the time, right? And, and so he doesn't want representative democracy, but in practice, that's what he gets. Uh, because you've got the democratic, sever you know, the, the democratic sovereignty moment, which is, which is more or less a referendum moment. I, mean, I, don't, I don't see how else to translate his view on that. 
But the rest of the time, he's fine with an aristocracy doing the agenda setting, doing the deliberation, doing the formulation of options, as long as the people you know, are consulted you know, maybe frequently, maybe he had in mind something like the Swiss, the Swiss system, it's true, mm -hmm. but I, what, I, what I think social scientists have, have taught us and what experience has taught us is that power and sovereignty, actually, actually sovereignty is such a you know, dated concept in some ways, but <coughs> power, it's not just about the final say, it's about shaping the agenda, it's about deliberating about it. And so I want to reconquer those spaces and you can't do that in a purely aggregative fashion. You have to involve arguments, exchange of views, and that, unfortunately, we don't know how to do it en masse. So it's a combination of, so I think Rousseau was wrong for all these reasons. He had a very impoverished notion of, I think, I mean, you know, democratic power or sovereignty as just this moment of final say. And I think it's enough. I think uh, deliberative democrats, among others, want a lot more. And, he, and because he didn't take into account deliberation or didn't seem to make it a desirable um, normative ideal, uh, he, he can cultivate the, 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 you know, the, the idea that we can have direct rule of all en masse. Yes, it works for referendums. It, it doesn't work for what comes upstream of the referendum. And so that's where I, I depart from, from him. Um, Um, so you asked if temporal openness was for me more essential to democracy than, than spatial openness. Um, that's, that's a good question. I, I didn't ask myself the question in, in those terms. I, I guess the answer is yes. But I do, um, what, maybe what I should distinguish too, which I've done so far fairly well is, um, I suppose because I have this, this notion of power that's a bit thicker than just the moment of final say, um, you can still have everyone involved as much as possible, or as much as you desire, in the deliberate, um, sorry, in, in the ID uh, gathering phase of the deliberation. That part, in theory, you, you, know, you can have a mini public that does the actual exchange of arguments, because that can only be done on a relatively small scale. So that's, that's the example of um, you know, the, constitutional, the Constitutional Council in the Icelandic case that I spent a lot of time on in the book. You have those 25 people, they could have been more, who go back and forth and write bits and pieces of the constitutional proposal. This is heavy duty deliberative work. Not, the, the whole country cannot be involved in this. This is not going to work. But what they, what they could do, what they did, which was really innovative and, and groundbreaking, is that they put their drafts online and they let anyone who wanted to comment and give input. So there, there was spatial openness in that phase of the decision-making process, which is very long and has multiple steps. And, um, so you can have this spatial openness in that phase. Uh, you can also have it in the final say. I mean, they had a referendum as well, right, on, on the final proposal. But you're right that when it comes to, um, to the legislative function of generating the laws, etc., are more concerned about uh, temporal openness. And we have enough people rotating in power to keep that, to keep the heart of power constantly um, renewed, open, influx of new ideas, new people. Otherwise, what happens is that if, if the same people stay in power, or or their sons, or you know, like the same sort of elites that reduce themselves stay in power, you've got an atrophy, an atrophy of the whole system and you, a corruption of the democratic nature of the regime. So that, that's the idea. But it's, got, it's got to circulate. And I think a lot of critical representation does that very well because it, it forces a, a rotation of people in power and they're all different each time. Um, so then you, you, you sort of um, created this tension between the right to vote and the quality of discourse, and and I, I have to say I was really surprised that you read the Finnish example that way because to me, I, I don't think you should be shocked that some people decided that, oh, I've read what other people have to say, I don't have much to add, I'm going to withdraw. My, my thinking is, look at the alternative. What's the alternative? The alternative is that there is uh, 
nothing. There's not a platform, there's nothing. Right. So you end up with very few people making the decisions without any kind of consultation. So to me, the fact that there was at least a, a crowdsourcing platform to consult people, and only a few actually contributed, but still it's, it's more than before. And also, the decision not to write something or to engage with what has already been written on this Finnish crowdsourcing platform comes after they actually have taken a look and read the contribution. Uh, I, I don't I think that. I don't think we should dismiss this, this sort of like to me that's participation, even if it's a, a minimalistic and, and hardly measurable type. I mean they spent time on the platform, they read some stuff, and they concluded, oh, you know, my ideas are already there, I don't need to spend time. I, I just I, I see, so I have a completely different assessment of the of the situation. I think I, if anything, if I had, if I had, I think I, I mis, I misread the example, and if I had read it correctly, it would have served my own position or like where I'm ah, coming from okay. better, which, hopefully, I, I didn't communicate super well. But okay. thank, thank you, thank you. Uh, and then on partisanship, so, um, so partisanship, the, the, the normative argument for partisanship, what is it? It's always that they, they offer this, um, they are, they are argument aggregators in a way, in, in a, in a large entity like the US or France, um, you, you need people who do the job of summarizing the main proposals from each camp so that it's legible and that people can go to the voting booths with a sense of what's on the table and what are the arguments for the cons. So in theory, that's what parties do. They should give you like the best argument for and against something, like a series of bullet points. Except that in practice, I'm afraid that's not what's happening. What's happening is that it's propaganda on both sides with the obfuscation, lies, um, spin. Uh, it's you know they're supposed to they're supposed to um, channel our individual abilities for falsifying other people's views. Right? Okay. That, that that's what's supposed to happen. But it turns out parties have become. It looks to me that they've become rent-seeking machines whose only goal is to get to power and stay there. And they're not trying to figure out the truth. And so they're not serving deliberation very well, as far as I can tell. So I'd love to, to you know, to be proven wrong, but um, I'm not so keen on, on parties. And, and also, I think that so there's this argument in, a, in the book by Leah Yippie and Jonathan White, um, uh, which I don't remember what it's called. It's in, defense of partisanship or something like that. They say, well, you can't imagine a democracy where you you wouldn't have parties because, you know, if you didn't have these aggregators of, of arguments or, or views, you would have to rely on um, heuristic and cues that basically uh, favor personal, personalities. Like, you, you just cho choose on identities, and it's even worse than choosing on but I'm thinking, look, I mean, it depends on how we define parties, maybe. But look what, what happened in France. Macron, Macron movement, it wasn't built as a party, and yet it managed to sweep through and win over all these other parties. So uh, 